It's This Week in Bourbon. The banks may be failing, but your bourbon, it's fail safe. And here's your headlines from March 17th, 2023. Kentucky lawmakers have passed House Bill 5, facing out the state tax on aging bourbon barrels. Jack Daniels has announced the release of its new 12-year-old Tennessee whiskey, along with batch two of 10-year-old. And this month, Green River will introduce two brand new expressions. But before we get started, here's a quick word from our partners. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to another edition of This Week in Bourbon, and this is the the first time we're doing This Week in Bourbon where we realized and remembered that we were going live on YouTube with it, <laughs> because when we did it last yeah. week, I know I set it up and I had completely had a brain fart and I said, oh yeah, uh, we're, we're live right now, and comments were coming in. Yeah, I just posted on the on the gram, uh, hey, we're live, so hopefully someone sees it, but if not... I'm used to just talking to you, so it, it'll be okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll do better about... I can't believe it's already been another week. Yeah, we'll do better about trying to get a little more ahead of that. So if... Yeah, it, if you're listening to this now, tune in next week on YouTube. Yeah, so we'll start doing this. Every Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. is typically when we go live, and or should I say, it's when we record. Uh, we're trying to go live with it and make sure that we can have some fun with it. So if you want to give a little razz or a zing or some sort of comment on what we're talking about, feel free to go ahead and, and let us know about it. Put it in the chat because that's what we'll be paying attention to. But so far, so good on everything in whiskey world. There's actually, this is probably the most news that we've had to go over in a long time. It's not like we're going to have to be stretching to try to find some jokes and, and be like, oh, we need to really dive into this topic because there's going to be plenty to go through for the next 45 oh minutes-ish. Oh, gosh. All right, well... Just hit me. Just keep going. Just, just go. Just get. Just hit me with the nerd first title. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do it. And so this one, it really isn't, it wasn't a press release. It wasn't a news article. This is something that I saw because it was posted in the St. Louis Bourbon Society Facebook group. And so if you have trouble keeping track of what bottles you have, there is actually a new app that launched around two weeks ago, and it's called Whiskey Shelf. So I gave it a quick spin. I downloaded it, and I feel that it has a lot of potential. So instead of you having to manually enter in all your whiskey bottles, maybe into a, into an app or into a spreadsheet, but instead this actually has a camera with a barcode scanner 
and it will populate the data for you. So you go, you open it up, scan your bottle, and it adds it to your database. And I was pleasantly surprised by it. Um, it'll be great when good, you know, when you can add pictures to it and stuff like that. But right now it's all visible inside of a list. I even tested it with Pursuit United. So it did come up. It does work for that. And you can also put in other details when you scan the bottle. You can put in the store you purchased at, the price you paid. And there's even a little button that asks if you would like to list it for sale. I don't, I don't know what that's for, but I'd imagine that'll come later. There's also another feature in there that maybe for a lot of people out there that it has an infinity bottle tracker. So you can keep a tab on everything that you've added into the infinity bottle. So again, it's called Whiskey Shelf. And I know that it's at least on the iOS app store. I didn't check the Google Play store. I didn't know uh, people kept track of their bourbon bottles, but I guess that's a thing. Oh, dude, I used to. Well, I guess I you do track your purchases. I used to do that all the time until it just got out of hand. And I said, you know what? I see how much money I'm spending. This is not a good idea. <laughs> I guess, you know, it'd be good, you know, when our kids get older is to do fill levels on the app <laughs> where we, we know exactly where it is. And then like, be like, well, Rowan, I just saw the fill levels below my app says, you know, you've been hitting up my shit. <laughs> There's at least four ounces <laughs> missing out of here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, no, it is cool. I, I mean, if you're keeping track, I probably wouldn't keep track of my bottles, but I'm sure some people would enjoy that, especially if it's like, a, you know, bottles worth that were something and stuff you're not opening. Yeah. Um, but stuff you're opening, I'm not sure you want to keep track of. But. Yeah, there's there wasn't anything that said, you know, value or anything like that. But because I'm pretty sure what Blue Book's been down forever. I don't think there's an online resource that centralizes the data of where you can find values for whiskey anymore. But that would have been really cool if they had something where it's like, oh, OK, I'll go ahead and scan in my 2017 William Lou Weller. And I know I have it in here. And then all of a sudden it looks into a central database and it says, oh, well, by the way, this bottle is also worth X amount of dollars. Are you sure you want to open yeah. that? <laughs> well, I would love for something to have values so people would stop texting me asking for values <laughs> because I have no clue what values are anymore. <laughs> but they assume because we're in the bourbon podcast world that I did used to know what values are, but I have zero clue what they are anymore. And I get... At least probably, I don't know, a handful a week. And I'm like, uh, just quit asking. Yeah, well, the most recent one, somebody asked me if they knew like what a what one of the, like the recent like boss hogs of Whistlepig went for. And I was like, I have, dude, I am so out of it. I'm not even paying attention to that anymore. But I really wish there was a central database that somebody could go to. And I think you just have to go to all the auctions and everything like that and figure out exactly what the hell is everything selling for nowadays. I do miss the bottle blue book. That was that was always a good like someone asking him like here's the link, set it up, <laughs> quit asking me. Let me Google that. And now me. I have now I have nothing to send. Mm -hmm. to, but that's okay. I know. Not to say call Justin's, but no, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't anymore, do that so. anymore either. <laughs> it's, it's like I don't know. I don't know who you call. Yeah, it's, you're right. At this point, it's kind of just like well, hold on to it and hope for the best or drink it. Either way, you're gonna be safe. That's right. Yep. It's going to go up in value, mostly. We'll see. Oh, there's a, Maybe. There's so much stuff. We should probably take that as a sidebar for another podcast in the future. Be like, I think we did. We did talk about that. We said, what are today's bottles that we feel that could be valuable? And I, I think that we, yeah, I think actually, I forget which episode we did that on. I know we recorded one. I think we did with Fred. Yeah. It was like his bourbon's investment. And then Fred was kind of talking about what bottles he thinks will be worth. Or something, yeah. You know, of course, it's like everything. It's H Barton, and you're like, there's always gonna be H Barton. So, <laughs> it's all the same twelve to fifteen year stuff we've had forever. <laughs> yeah, there's never gonna be any of it, and it keeps showing yeah. up. So, yeah. And like Evan says in the chat, the market is very down right now. And yes, that's uh, that is kind of true. So Don't tell me usually I'm sitting there hanging on to two E H Taylor Tornado warehouse survivors. So the bourbon market doesn't uh, follow the stock market. So you, or it doesn't counter contradict usually, you know, like one goes uh, up, one goes up or one goes down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nope. Exactly. It's not like gold, you know, so. pretty much, pretty much. It's all, it's all bad news bears right now. Cause probably everybody uses their free cash flow from the stocks to buy bourbon. So that's anyways, we got a lot of topics, so I should Let's stop rambling going. on the first one. <laughs> so humble Baron, it's the home to the world's long, longest bar. 
and it is going to announce its official opening date on March 23rd, 2023. So this restaurant, bar, and live music venue will debut in Shelbyville, Tennessee at the iconic nearest green distillery. The distillery is a popular destination, welcoming more than 110,000 visitors in the past 12 months, with that number expected to triple by the end of the year, featuring a 19-station, 518-foot-long showpiece bar that wraps stunningly around an indoor stage. Humble Baron allows guests to enjoy an elevated fare and creative cocktails while watching live entertainment. The grand opening weekend performance will include American Idol's country music artist Hunter Girl and international DJ Bova. The Humble Baron, I don't know who that is. As much as as much you know, electronic dance what? music I listen I to. I thought for sure. I've never somebody like Bova you would notice. No, I got nothing there. So the Humble Baron is more than a hundred feet longer than the current record holder for the longest permanent continuous bar in the world. The bar program was crafted in partnership with Gin and Luck, the hospitality company behind the renowned cocktail institution Death and Co. and Black Owned Spirits taking center stage. Signature libations include the Queen's Gambit, featuring Sora Liquor and Hella Cocktail Company's Apple Blossom Bitters and local premium Tennessee whiskey, pineapple gum, and lemon juice, as well as Dear Fawn, which is a spin on the favorite classic cocktail, the Espresso Martini, which you swap out the usual vodka for, again, Tennessee whiskey. The assistant beverage director, DeAndre A. Jackson, leads the bar's cocktail innovation for its culinary offerings, and James Beard nominee and critically acclaimed chef and television host, Chef G. Garvin, has crafted a menu of sophisticated yet familiar dishes, including the restaurant's signature Nashville hot shrimp and grits and snow crab claws sautéed in brown butter and sage. And renowned Atlanta chef Ooh. Jay Craddock will helm the kitchen as executive chef, bringing more than 18 years of experience and passion for the innovative Southern cuisine to humble Baron. That was a lot to take in. You got EDM, you got Death Go, <laughs> you got, got, uh, you got famous chefs. I know, you got Nashville shrimp. I mean, that's a hell a lot of, that's a lot going on in that festival. I, I mean, I'll say this is one thing that I guess you got to give it off, you know, hats off to Uncle Nearest. Like, they, they thought this out. Like, they went all in and they were like, we are going to do it to the nines with it. And I, I'm, I can't wait to go check it out. I mean, you give me some really good food and some really great cocktails. I'm a happy person. Yeah, they're taking the most awarded bourbon to the most epic festival ever. <laughs> and they're they're so I love it. I love their gumption. It's always something big. You got to be the first or the biggest. That's just how it is. Yep, I, I like it. Right. Um, but I do like the Uncle Nearest stuff. I, I had some of their. I was down in Tennessee and had a. Uh, you know the rye that we like. We reviewed that, that with from, Canadian rye. That was really good. I revisited that. I was like, "Wow, it's really good." And then I had some uh, their younger Tennessee stuff, assuming it's made somewhere we all know. But um, it was really good. So yeah, well, hats off to Uncle Nearest. I want to come to this festival. We know what to expect. Well, yeah. For this next one, let's stay in Tennessee, and that's because Chattanooga whiskey. They have named Tiana Saul as their head distiller succeeding founding head distiller Grant McCracken, who will continue exclusively as chief product officer. Saul began her career with Chattanooga Whiskey in 2015 as the assistant manager at the Chattanooga Whiskey Experimental Distillery before transitioning to the production team in 2017. Over the next four years, she worked on or helped lead nearly every aspect of the production process. And Saul shifted her focus to new product development in 2018, and she developed a variety of expressions, including barrel-aged gins and infused liqueurs, which helped establish Chattanooga Whiskey's experimental single-batch series as one of the most prolific and innovative collections in the industry. In addition, her blending efforts helped shape two critically acclaimed expressions, the Chattanooga Whiskey Finishing Series and the Bottled and Bond Vintage Series. As head distiller, Saul will lead the production team of 15 full-time employees and cover all aspects of production from grain to glass. With the promotions of Saul to head distiller, McCracken will continue in his role as chief product officer exclusively, focusing on strategic planning goals related to expansion, innovation, and continuous improvement. Awesome. Congratulations to her. That's a amazing accomplishment. And uh, Grant's very talented, and I'm, I'm excited to see what becomes of Chattanooga. We've been big fans of theirs. They're always pushing the envelope, you know, Coming out with the Tennessee malt was not something probably someone would be like, hey, this is a great idea, you know, but uh, they've made it, you know, and hung their hat on it. They've done very well with it. And uh, I'm excited to see, you know, they, they're they're very into the whole experimental, experimental, uh, you know, side of things. So I'm excited for 
you know, what's to come in the future. I mean, after you do 111 experiments, at least one of them. <laughs> That's <still>. right. <laughs> That's right. 91 to 111. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they, they do have good stuff. But now if, if you want to know the, the basically the, the punchline to that joke, you have to go and listen to our podcast that we did with the folks from Chattanooga. And I was basically... I like my my insides were curling. I was like, how 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 could you do this? This doesn't seem like a good way to do business. But you know, they're they're here now and they're they're killing it. So it's just it's just all got to go through that Solera tank, Kenny. That's what it is. I guess you got to go there and see the Solera tank system, and then Tim has to pick it all and blend it. He which he's he does a good job. So that's that's the that's that's the key to the success. Solera and Tim. <laughs> is that what it is? Make a t shirt that says that. <laughs> That's right. Coming soon. So if you live in the Northeast and especially in New York and you are basically coming out of the pandemic and you were you really loved having all your favorite beverage alcohols being shipped directly to you, or maybe you have someone you know that like to order, well, New York's craft beverage producers, they were temporarily authorized to ship their products to consumers in New York during the pandemic. And that's something the wine industry has done safely since the 1980s. However, this temporary privilege has now expired and the industry needs your help to enact legislation to make sure that you can ship spirits directly once again and permanently this time. So if you live in New York and you want the ability to purchase spirits from any of the 173 craft distillers in the state, you can go to shipmyspirits.org and that coalition now has an active campaign to help change the shipping laws. So go ahead, again, shipmyspirits.org. Well, you know, we're all for shipping. That, that's, so. that's You're right. <laughs> Anything we can do to help break down these these dominoes and help them fall one at a time, we're gonna we're gonna make it happen. You know, our that's how we advocate yeah. around here. Yeah, that's it's as simple as that. We're all for shipping, so that's all we need to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> as far as comfort say. <laughs> and next story. There we go. <laughs> that's right. I, I feel like we gotta get through a lot, so I'm trying not to blab well it's okay we, we only got like two more three more here on the, just the, the first news cycle here and this one ah uh, well you were daunting well, me this whole time you're like we got like an hour worth of <laughs> stuff to get you there. gotta understand for the past few weeks we've we've basically just sitting there trying to we're just trying to fill time that's what it's been and now we've we actually have something but i'll, I'll give i'll give it to you this. so this this next one it's not even bourbon related it it's one of these that just made it through Mark Brown's newsletter, and I said, you know what, this is kind of fun, so let's talk about it. So according to new data from the Finder Consumer Confidence Index, 17% of roughly roughly 2,100 survey U.S. consumers have made purchases while under the influence of alcohol in the past 12 months, spending roughly $309 each for a total of $14 billion. The top two drunk shopping categories are shoes, clothes or accessories, and food, with 47% of the respondents who have shopped drunk saying that they bought the items in these categories. Other popular drunk spending categories were, of course, alcohol, cigarettes, and gambling, all tied with participation of 34% of eligible respondents. Motor vehicles came out as the most expensive category at an average spend of $2,038, although it was the lowest ranked category besides the other, with 16% of respondents who shopped drunk in the past year purchasing a motor vehicle while intoxicated. Men and women both shop drunk differently. Examining the responses by gender, <laughs> the survey found that roughly one in four male respondents, around 26%, they say that they have made a purchase under the influence in last year, which is two and a half times the rate of the surveyed amount of women. The top drunk shopping option for women are shoes, clothes, or accessories, whereas men are most likely to buy food. The survey also revealed the differences in drunk shopping habits by generation, region, and income. Millennial respondents had the highest rate of shopping under the influence, followed by Gen Z, Gen X, and then at the very end of baby boomers. Okay. First of all, 21.6% of people drunk shopping are drunk on fireball. So that's probably why <laughs> Mark Brown. <laughs> that's why they put it and, in there. And uh, how the hell did they get this data? Were they like, are you drunk shopping? <laughs> like, uh, like after whoa, you spent $400. Should we breathalyze you and see what your BA? I'm just curious how they collected this data. Well, I mean, but. they they surveyed 2,100 U.S. consumers. And that's Oh, they just admitted to say they were drunk. Yeah, driving. yeah. And I mean, I don't know how you get selected to do this this type of thing. But yeah, you take a small sample size and you need to help extrapolate it out. And that's why they got to this whole idea that there was $14 billion spent on drunk shopping because 17% of the, of the population, they think, did that. 
I could see that. I bought some dumb shit drunk. <laughs> oh, I, Just, I, I'm not going to deny it. I do it. It's it's. I'm one of those people. You know me. I'm kind of a frugal and and fickle shopper. And I will sit there and I will I will debate whether to spend five or ten extra dollars on something. And I mean, I will spend hours like looking through, trying to find a better deal and all this other kind of stuff. But when I have a few drinks, I just, I finally go, screw it. I'm just going to go ahead and buy it. I mean, I, I, d- is that what happened when you bought all the ceiling tiles and lockers <laughs> for, for our, our warehouse location? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I did talk to three different <laughs> vendors of ceiling tiles. <laughs> Were you were under the influence, Kenny? <laughs> okay. And that's what I was like, you know what? I'm tired of waiting. I'm just going to go ahead and start sending messages and see if I can't find something. You know, it's, I mean, drunk, being a little buzzed and being on Instagram, I've, I I can admit to buying some solo stove accessories <laughs> or <laughs> or uh, something. Um, yeah, I've, I've definitely been there, so. But I'll tell you this, I haven't been... I haven't bought a car. I've never been like, <laughs> you know what, honey? We should go. Uh, I know you didn't ask. I went on before we go. To- <laughs> I know you didn't ask for it, but I got a Can new car. Can we test drive it? Yeah. <laughs> Can we test drive it while we're there? But, but I will say I haven't been so intoxicated that I purchased something and it showed up and I just don't remember ordering it. I at least remember ordering it. I've never gotten to the point where just something shows up. I go, I don't know. Somebody must have stolen or hacked in my account. I got nothing. Yeah. I this is funny. I mean, I, I, how did I miss this article? I look at Mark Brown's newsletter every day. I guess it was tucked within like the, the boring wine and beer talks. Well, that, and that was cause I, cause I start scrolling and glaze over those. Well, I mean, I started off the top of the show. The biggest news that happened this week was of course, everything in Silicon Valley bank and how that went under. Right, the wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there was a lot of wineries and a lot of people that are on the West coast that all banked with Silicon Valley. And so that was the, I mean, that's what the news was all week is, is what's going to happen to all of these wineries that can't make payroll and they can't do this sort of stuff because all their funds are frozen until the fed can come in and get them their money back. And that could potentially be weeks or months. And, and, you know, for lack of a better term, from what I was reading, they said the problem was is that you had a few people that saw this happening. They went and cleared out all their cash out of the bank, and that started a panic. And so everybody went to try to go draw cash, and then they basically ran out. And now they're to the point where the Fed has to come in and make sure that people get their money back and all this other kind of stuff up to an insured amount. And if you had money in there that it wasn't insured, you might be at SOL for a little bit. But Back to the news story is that, yes, there were a lot of wineries that had this, and that's what really cluttered up the news feed for the past week of of trying to figure out what's what kind of ramifications does this have as it gets into the, uh, uh, not the spirits world, but the alcohol world in general. Yeah, I, heard, I was listening to some something today talking about how social media amplified the, you know, it's like, imagine if you had social media during the Great Depression, everybody's like, pull your money out of your bank, <laughs> you know, <laughs> doing a reel or story like... Looking at, look at, uh, don't everything. trust so your it government. It increases panic ever, even more so. So, uh, what a weird time we live in. It's, it's you know, at least it wasn't toilet paper. It'd make you go out and buy a bunch of that again. I know it's, it's strange, but yeah. All right. Well, that was a good story. Hopefully the next one's just as good. Well, this was actually our first news line of the day. And of course we talked about it at length for the round table last week. And that's that Kentucky lawmakers, This past week, they fast-tracked the bourbon industry's priority of phasing out the state tax on aging bourbon barrels. And that's even come from despite the pleas from officials in distillery-heavy counties like Nelson and Bullitt that the loss of revenue they say will devastate their communities. The bill to gradually repeal the so-called barrel tax passed the House of Representatives by a comfortable margin of 59 to 40, though several Republicans dissented. The GOP holds 80 uh, 80 of the 100 seats in the body. The bill now moves to the state Senate. House Bill 5 will begin phasing out the barrel tax, which generates around $33 million a year in tax revenue. And that was in 2020, sorry, 33, 33 million a year in 2026, with a complete removal by 2039. And House Budget Chairman Representative Jason Petrie said that the growth of the industry and actual barrel tax receipts are not expected to plateau until the 2030s. GOP House leaders separately advanced the bill to mitigate any funding losses for public schools by pledging money from the state savings fund to ensure that no school district's barrel tax funding drops below its 2022 to 2023 level. 
but local officials said the barrel tax provides a crucial funding for fire protection, roads, water, and other community infrastructure necessary to support the booming industry. You're elected by the people. You're not elected by the distillery, says Nelson County Judge Executive Tim Hutchins, and that's what he told the House Budget Committee on Monday. His county home, his county is home to Heaven Hill and Sazerac's Barton 1792, among other distilleries. I'm just telling you, we need the money to survive. Are we going to have to cut services, sir? I mean, it's coming down to that. And Josh Ballard, he's a city commissioner in Makers Mark's hometown of Loretto. He said that the industry's claim that the barrel tax is hampering its growth is bellied by the Kentucky Distillers Association's own figures showing a huge boom in distillery investments and barrel production in recent years. He said, in quote, to add insult to injury, the bourbon industry claims that the barrel tax discourages growth. And in the same breath, they boast about a $5 billion worth of expansion currently underway in Kentucky, and their own data proves it does not discourage growth. Though Kentucky is deeply ingrained in the history of bourbon, the state is not entitled to be the home of the industry. And that's what House Speaker David Osborne said. He said, quote, the distilleries are not going away, he said, but they're going to continue to make bourbon there. They're going to continue to make their bourbon here, but this will help cement ourselves as the bourbon capital of the world. And I believe it is reasonable. So I know we talked about this at length, but this did get fast tracked pretty quickly since we did talk about it. I should just not. <laughs> oh, talk, yeah. But, uh, hey, did you get any <laughs> teachers like any kind of hate mail or anything? Maybe knock on your door yet? Actually, not yet. So surprisingly, but uh, it, I mean, 17 years, though, is when it's I think that's what said was going to be phased out. So, I mean, hell, it's going to be a long time for, you know, Rowan and Stella will be dealing with this by now. <laughs> by then, <laughs> Rowan, Harlow and Stella. But uh, I mean, that that's just a. That's just I, I Tim Hutchins. I know him. Great guy. Just got elected. It's just politician talk. You were doing just fine in 2015, 2020. The schools were okay, you know, before all the barrel expansion happened. So you just don't need, you know, five more schools. And but they just said in there that that it, it's they pledged that the schools will not lose money. It will stay at the same exact funding that you have today. That's what they pledged. So. Right. I don't know. And now they're saying, well, it's not just the schools. It's, you know, the roads and the water and the fire department. Well, if it's the roads and the water, then why can't they help, uh, with, especially with water, why can't they, uh, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> All right. I get it on. because there's more expansions happening and people are asking for water and they're not giving it to them. They're not, yeah, run, they're having they're to go run, to other they're counties. Not the pipes. Yeah. Barstown doesn't have the infrastructure to support the distilleries that they're in, except for one. So that's all I have to say about that. And it's, uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next topic for, well, it's trouble. okay. I got in a little, little trouble myself too with it because, um, everybody, if you don't know, uh, his name is Matt Jones. He runs KSR Kentucky sports radio, and he came out and even said that the elimination of the bourbon barrel tax is going to raise taxes on the citizens of all the counties that have distilleries and is a giveaway to bourbon companies. And I, okay. I want, I, I want to see, I want to see reports. Okay. Sorry, well, I, I responded back and I said, I said, you know, as a devout Kentucky and, and bourbon enthusiast, I hate to tell you that, you know, you're wrong in this one. And I, I got some, I got some hate backed at me. I mean, some people were, well, he, they were all like, well, what about the whiskey fungus and blah, blah, blah. We didn't ask for this. And it's like, I, it's, it's a hundred year old problem. Like, it's not like it's been, it's not like it changed over the past few years. And it's not like this money was going to fix that anyway. Yeah. Let's look at the tourism numbers, how much money economics money has been spent, construction jobs, employment, the average pay of a distillery worker, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and how much benefit the bourbon industry has brought to this state. You take that away. I'd, I, I just I would love to see that report, you know, all the benefits versus this this tax. It's so stupid. I can't even wrap my head around it. It's so short. The KDA, it's the just, KDA does make that report every single year of at least Kentucky distilleries. No, yeah. I know they do, but no one talks about that side of it. They're just like, oh, look at it. I mean, they don't talk about the 11 and a half percent tax that we pay Bingo. you know to right there already and then on top of that it gets state state sales tax and then all the prop other property taxes and all the i mean there's tax tax on tax on tax i mean it's like what when's enough enough you know it's just and this is like whatever. the the baby tax and matt jones matt jones is 
I, I'm, I'm going to shut up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, all I, I was going to say is that this is the baby tax this season and like like a big tax. I mean, for us, I know we said it on the round table. It's like we paid, I think, $1,200 last year. And that's just because we had around like 1,000 or 1,200 barrels in inventory just in Kentucky. And so that's what we paid. So you take that to somebody that has a couple million, you know, you extrapolate that out more and more and more. So this is, and, and I think that's probably one of the things that's overlooked. And you had mentioned the 11%. For anybody that doesn't know, Kentucky has an 11% wholesale tax. So as a bourbon producer, and as soon as you sell that to a distributor, you get taxed 11%. It, like, no other state has that crazy... Well, I mean, there's a few other states, but Kentucky is by far one of the heaviest. So out of the... And for us, just to give you some data points, out of the nine states we're distributed in, we make the least amount of money by selling our bottles in Kentucky. And I think that by uh, long yes. shot. <laughs> and I think that just is it's it's crazy. And and that doesn't really take into account the barrel tax. I mean that's that's a tax that basically takes away our bottom line between everybody. But just it goes to show you that there's so much taxation just from the Kentucky sales side that it doesn't make it in our benefit. Like we would make a lot more money if we just went to more bottles to Texas or to Missouri or Florida or whatever it is. You gonna take a deep breath? <laughs> All right, I'll take it. Deeper. All right, here's our last news one, but this is a fun one. It's not even bourbon related, but again, it came up in my Google news feed this time. And I said, you know what? This is kind of fun only because of a tech guy. I find this pretty interesting only because of, I mean, at this point, everybody knows about chat GBT. So according to open AIs, they now have GBT version four, or GBT four, and it has the ability to pass infamously tricky tests such as the law school admission test or like the LSAT. And it has also passed the master sommelier theory examinations. So the master sommelier qualification was in the highest accolades in the industry. And it's split into theory and practical examinations that take many months of dedicated study to successfully navigate. While chat GBT, G, GPT, sorry, didn't attempt the practical element of the qualification, it did ace all three levels of its theory papers. And according to the reports, OpenAI's invention scored a hefty 92% on the introductory Court of Master Sommelier test, an 86% on the Certified Sommelier exam, and a 77% on the Advanced Sommelier exam. And GPT-4 also scored an impressive 163 on the LSAT, a sufficient score to gain entry into a top 20 law school in the U.S. Yeah, this is way over my head. I would fail everything. <laughs> LSATs and all this. I tell you what. If you want something to go do, go ahead and ask Chat GBT. Say, what is Bourbon Pursuit? It does. It knows exactly. Okay. It'll tell you it's the official podcast of Bourbon. It tells you exactly who we are and everything like that, too. Ask them if about the the barrel tax. <laughs> yeah, there you says. go. <laughs> ask about <laughs> what, what should we do about the barrel tax? <laughs> well, like I said, it was a pretty cool story. But it is. Cool. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I'm always amazed by by technology, and just goes to show you that who knows? Maybe we. Uh, we won't, we won't need sommeliers anymore. We just look at the computer and have it tell us what we need to drink. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah, but let's go ahead. We'll take a quick commercial break. We're back with some bourbon release news. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug-and-play tools built for marketing campaigns, from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's point-of-sale Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon. The farmers who grow the grain, 
the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Welcome back, everybody. And also give a shout out to Daily Bourbon Drinkers. He said he just passed the LSAT, so it's not that impressive. <laughs> oh, well, I'd probably fit. Yeah, I, I never even attempted it, so. I'm not good at essays. But congratulations on passing that. Congratulations. That's uh, that's big. That is big. That is, now you can be a lawyer and, and create tax laws for something. If not, you need to basically defend Ryan for something he's going to say. That's pretty much, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right, so our first one is that Jack Daniels, they've announced the release of its new 12-year-old Tennessee whiskey along with batch two of its 10-year-old Tennessee whiskey. The limited whiskeys are the latest in Jack Daniels' Aged series. It's an annual release of age-dated expressions that celebrate the brand's heritage. Grain bills for both expressions are the 80% corn, 12% malted barley, and 8% rye, and charcoal mellowed before aging in new, toasted, charred American white oak barrels. Jack Daniels' 12-year-old Tennessee whiskey is at 107 proof, and the 10-year-old whiskey, batch two, is 97 proof. They will be available in the United States beginning in March in 700 ml bottles for suggested retail price of $80 and $70, respectively. I just remember when we were there for the barrel pick, and we are like, where are the age barrels? We're like, we, we don't, don't age that. anything over four, year, four to six years old. <laughs> and, now, and now it's... And, well, rightfully so. They should be releasing double-age statements. But that was just funny when we were there. Uh, they were like, what are you talking about? We we get rid of everything. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Us being so naive. Yeah, that's cute. Uh, no, I've, I've been liking a lot of these. The only one I didn't like was that sherry one. that they The single malt that they drowned in sherry probably because it was bad because it was a single malt. And... Uh, but everything else has been great from Jack Daniels as far as like special releases and stuff, I think. Well, I we got these samples in the mail. I didn't get a chance. They're literally sitting on the bar over here. So we got we to gotta crack open a try them soon. Maybe for another whiskey quickie. We'll find out. I'm, I'm open. I'm ready. <laughs> we, we actually have a lot of bottles to go through for whiskey quickies. We got we to gotta figure out when to do it again. I feel like it's been a while and I'm like, there's got to be a ton of them. Yeah, it's, it's starting to creep over into the floor now again. I know. Can't wait till we get our place up and running. Yes. Um, So we can shoot these like regularly. Knock them out nice and quickly. So Mm -hmm. here we go. The next one, Wolf Spirits Puncher's Chance Bourbon. They're announcing the fourth release in its growing portfolio of fine American whiskeys. And it's Puncher's Chance, the Undisputed, is a single barrel bottling of five to six-year-old Kentucky straight bourbon whiskeys weighing in at 108 proof. Produced under the careful stewardship of master distiller Kevin Curtis and master blender Stephen Hughes of IJW Whiskey Company, the Undisputed is focused first and foremost on flavor with very low dilution from barrel to bottle. Bottled at almost cash strength, the Undisputed starts with a mash bill of 75% corn, 13% rye, and 12% malted barley, and has an SRP of $55. Really? Cash strength's like almost, it said it was bottled at 108, so... And it's almost bottled at cash rate. Well, I mean, I don't know. We've we pulled barrels that are like 115. I figured that's 108 is kind of close to 115. Wouldn't you think? Uh, maybe I get. Yeah, you're probably right. You're just you're just I, trying to find the holes in the in the story here, aren't you? You're just mad because they took I, our number. That's, that's I, I am, <laughs> but I know we know Kevin Curtis, a good guy, and uh, I, I, I'm still don't know what this Puncher's Chance brand is all about. I I know they contract distilled it maybe in danville or something but uh that's all i know about them really and they're from oregon right or something i don't aren't they based in oregon about that or? i just know that i thought i read that in the press release they were like from oregon the only thing that i know is that ijw you go and you look at it there is a ton i mean a flipping ton of money behind this company and it's very much i, I don't know i don't know how i feel about it just because it's very much like, okay, how do we create it? It's not like a person or somebody behind it. It doesn't feel that way. It just feels like, I don't really know. I, I don't know. It's, it's just doesn't, it doesn't have, it's not, the picture's not all there. You know, they, they pull in the celebrities, they pull in all this sort of stuff to talk about the bottles and, and move it and stuff like that. So I, I don't know. I, I'm still kind of undecided about it. It says 
some whiskey news out of Eugene, Oregon. No, there you go. Wolf Spirit. So there, that's where I got the Oregon thing. But uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. There's so much mystery behind this brand. It's like you'd love for someone to come out and be like, "Hey, we have something to do with this." <laughs> <laughs> Instead of just being, maybe it's the whatever the AI thing you talk about. They're like, "Create a whiskey." Here it is. <laughs> actually, that's actually a really good. Let's let's do that real quick. Chat GBT. The GBT bourbon is puncher's chance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be. It could be. All right. So while that's going, I'll go ahead and start the next one here. So Whistle Pig founder Raj Bakta, he parted ways with the rye whiskey brand back in 2019. And the result was an acriminous split that forced him out of the company. A few years later, he returned to the spirits industry with an unexpected focus on Armagnac. And now he's actually back in the whiskey world with the new Bakta 2013 bourbon finished in Armagnac casks. The nine-year-old... No way. Yeah, no. How crazy, huh? So the nine-year, five-month bourbon is sourced from MGP and has a mash bill of 99% corn and 1% malted barley. It was finished in casks that previously held the Bakta 50-year Armagnac for a few months, a blend that was matured for at least a half a century. Bakta said that the inspiration for this bourbon actually came from the last Whistle Pig Boss Hog release that he was involved in, The Black Prince which came out in 2017 and was also finished in Armagnac barrels. It's 100 point, sorry, 100.6 proof and is available on the Bakta website for $150. It's hilarious. All these people at Source MGP, I see more and more of this 99% corn coming out because it's all they have left. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we haven't looked at any, I haven't talked to MGP lately, so I have no idea what is in their, or I should say squid, but yeah, whatever. What's what's in their stocks I, about seeing this? It's every single brand has these 99% corn stuff. I see bottles. It's funny. I'm just, I don't know why I think it's funny. I'm being rude tonight. I think the tax thing just got me all worked up. Well, I mean, it definitely reminds me of, Remember when everybody was pushing out 13 year light whiskey? <laughs> light whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like. And 15 year beam and 12 year old Barton. It's all like rinse or beam. Yeah. And, and look what happened. All that stuff's gone. And so all of a sudden, now you're sitting here going, all right, well, when's the next high age statement come out? Flood the market. People like it. And then it's gone. And then you guys got to wait for the next thing. That's the game plan. We're the only idiots that don't follow it. All right. And by the way, I uh, I asked ChatGPT to make me ideas for a bourbon brand, and here we go. So the first one... Hunter's Chance? Uh, no, actually, the first one is called Oak and Barrel Bourbon. Like, pretty obvious. This name highlights the aging process that bourbon goes through in charred oak barrels while also evoking a sense of sophistication and elegance. <laughs> uh, this next one will probably get you sued. Sounds like every press release I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, honestly, we should probably ask Chet GBT to start writing press releases for us because it's just, it's all buzzwords. All right, this next one gets you sued and it's called Rebel Reserve Bourbon. <laughs> so the name conveys a bold, independent spirit that's associated with the American South where bourbon is traditionally produced. The word reserve oh, also yeah. suggests no chance. Yeah, this word reserve also suggests that this bourbon is something special and worthy of saving for a special occasion. So another one, I think this one actually is almost taken too. Bluegrass Bourbon Company. This is a name a nod to the Bluegrass region of Kentucky, which is known for its fertile soil. It also has a classic timeless feel that appeal to bourbon enthusiasts. All right, there's two more. I'm, I'm not going to go through these. All right, Riverfront Bourbon. The name plays off the idea of the Ohio River, which borders Kentucky and is an important waterway for bourbon transportation. It also suggests a connection to the natural world and the beauty of Kentucky landscape. I actually might have something there. That does, uh, All right. I, and then uh, it's waterfront, right? And then we... The waterfront park is what's yeah. Here. Maybe we do waterfront bourbon. Uh, then there's charred oak bourbon. That's a gimme. And the last one is Heritage Reserve bourbon. The name emphasizes the tradition <laughs> of the history behind bourbon production, while suggesting this is a high quality, limited edition product. It's a name that would appeal to collectors and connoisseurs of fine spirits. And all you gotta do is throw some ninety nine percent MGP <laughs> corn whiskey in there and call it Heritage something. People uh, buy it. it. That's that's the way it is. No yeah. fail. No, no fail. If it's if it's got double digits on it, man, that's that's an easy sell too. Yep. All right. It's too easy. Let's keep going here. We got we got three more to get through to the end here. So Four Gate Whiskey Company, they've announced the latest in their very limited Majestic Wood series. 
I don't know if that means you got to like go and frog through the woods or something like that. It's the majestic woods. But this is going to feature Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey Finish and exotic oak casks from Japan and Brazil. The Majestic Wood Series will launch with two initial offerings. Both start with a base of a whiskey of seven-year-old Kentucky Straight Bourbon. And the first two is finished in, sorry, first of the two is finished in Japanese Mizanara Oak, while the second is finished in Brazilian Ambarana Oak Casks. Bottled in very limited quantities, with only 1,673 bottles of the Mizanara Oak produced at 117.4 proof, point four proof, and 2,070 bottles of the Brazilian Ambarana Oak were produced at 115.1 proof, and these bottles will retail for $250 each. Man, I, I, I was thinking about this Ambarana thing the other night, and, it, and it's incredible that, shout out you know, to Pablo and Rare Character for being the... I think one of the first ones that did this, but you have a company like Pernod Ricard doing one with rabbit hole and all these people doing it. That's incredible that it has taken on, you know, this kind of just momentum. It's, it's fascinating to me that uh, I don't know. It's pretty, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's unfortunate because you see something like this that happens (laughs) inside of the tech realm. You would see somebody that has a little bit of IP that takes off while they get gobbled up and, their technology gets brought in to help being built into a, a you know, a, a, inside of a larger machine. Unfortunately, in this world, you have a great idea. Anybody can go and copy it. And that's exactly what happened. Right. Yeah. It just takes, <laughs> just buying some wood from Brazil. I don't know. I, I mean, you're right. Hats off to him. I don't know how he found out about it, but Man alive, you're right. It seems like everybody's coming out with some. I mean, Blake just has his Amberana Oak from Sealbox. Like everybody's doing it. So hop on the train. Oh, I mean, yeah. Tell me a brand that's not doing it. Well, I can tell you a few. Are us? There's, I know that, but <laughs> I mean, it's it's wild how many have taken on with this Amberana and you know, Mizanara was a thing too. I guess probably four or five years mm-hmm. ago. But uh, there's a little bit of that's still hanging on but uh, well it got expensive yeah, the, i mean oh it w- is when we say expensive yeah. y'all like we're talking i think it was anywhere from like three to five thousand dollars for an empty barrel and they leak that's what the thing about mizanara is they, they, they they don't hold us tight but um i really don't like the mizanara profile i don't know but well you're in luck because you can get a full barrel of regular bourbon for three to five thousand dollars yeah sign me up <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, we haven't done this in a while. Ready for some RTD talk? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah. But by the way, somebody had posted, they were like, guys, I don't know what RTDs mean. Ready to drink category. And this is, we, this is, I think this is, uh, before I say this is, <laughs> this is the next phase of where a lot of companies are looking because there, it, there is a lot of potential on what you can do for growth of the category, for having something that people can drink quickly. As Ryan has said 14 times before, you can bring it on the boat, you can bring it camping, you can bring it when you're going out, you bring it tailgating, and you bring spirits as a part of that. So no longer are you just having to sit there and drink beer or take uh, Bud Lights with you. Instead, you got a lot more options that are out there. So this is a booming category that we do see out there. So This one is from Jim Beam, and they've launched Kentucky Coolers. And this was made in partnership with the Boston Beer Company. Kentucky Coolers are now available nationwide in four flavors. Strawberry Peach, or sorry, Strawberry Punch, Black Cherry Lemonade, Sweet Tea Lemonade, Citrus Punch. And Jim Beam Kentucky Coolers are 5% ABV and 120 calories, with a suggested retail price of $17 for a 12-can variety pack, $9 for a single flavor six-pack, and $3.50 for a single 24-ounce can. However, it does say right in the packaging that this is malt beverage. It's not bourbon or distilled spirits. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, I kind of found that. So I'm, now see, I know why they were partnered. Out on I know it. that we're in the partnership with Boston Beer Company now because yeah. Truly's not doing so hot and they're trying to figure out what the hell they do with it all. <laughs> we got all this malt beverage sitting around. We need something to do with. Yeah, because that's all you read in Mark Brown's reports is how poorly truly's doing and white claws just and high noon's just crushing them um i was trying to look at the sugar content on the, i was trying that's why i'm pausing sorry that's okay um you can go ahead i was trying to find look at all you want uh, somebody david in the chat just says pass on coolers 
I get it. I think that's probably a, a throwback to something in the 90s when you had those, the wine coolers, and that probably rings a bell. But I don't know. I, I was I was interested to read this, and then because you see Jim Beam getting into it, and then you read that it's malt beverage. I don't know. I feel that you, know, you utilize the Jim Beam name. You just figured it would have been bourbon, but it's not. Yeah, but Americans are stupid and they like sweet shit, so they'll drink this True. up. That's the thing. <laughs> Unfortunately. I mean, get me wrong. I'll try it once. I shouldn't say Americans are stupid. They're just naive. Gullible. And, uh, bunch of, they're bunch gullible of and, and they like sweet and sugary stuff, so they'll, they'll love yeah. this. Just pour it all on. All right. You yep. ready for the last news article now? I am. Please. Here we go. Following a highly successful four-state launch in 2022, Green River Distilling Company, which is also part of Bardstown Bourbon Company, is expanding in 2023 with two new expressions and distribution in 21 new markets. This month, Green River will introduce Green River Kentucky Straight Weeded Bourbon in complement to their flagship high rye bourbon in 25 markets across the United States. Originally founded in 1885, Green River, which is DSP KY10, is the 10th oldest distillery in Kentucky, and prior to Prohibition, in Owensboro, Kentucky, it was one of the richest contributors to the bourbon industry with more than 20 distilleries. And Green River, known as the Whiskey Without Regrets, was the official, medi- medi- sorry, the official medicinal whiskey of the U.S. Marine Hospital and has been referred to and referenced as the most expensive whiskey ever sold, as 20 barrels were once traded for an interest in a Colorado gold mine. Fire and Prohibition relegated the brand to its history, but it was reestablished in 2022. The distillery also runs a successful contract distillation business, producing, aging, and bottling a number of other whiskeys. And Green River Weeded is comprised of 70% Kentucky-grown corn, 21% wheat, 9% six-row barley. And Green River Weeded is presented at 90 proof and is priced at a suggested retail price of $35. However, also with the expansion comes the launch of Green River Full Proof Single Barrel, a single barrel expression of Green River Kentucky Straight Bourbon presented at 119 proof and a a limited number of single barrels will be available annually for purchase by the barrel to select on- and off-premise retailers. Each retailer will be able to hand-select their unique single barrel on-site at Green River in Owensboro, Kentucky, and this particular expression of Green River foolproof single barrel is offered a suggested retail price of $60. If you said it, I'm sorry, what's the foolproof proof? 119. 119, gotcha. I don't know how they got to that, but that's, that's what it is. I guess that's the entry proof, right? I don't know. Is it? Uh, I mean, usually full. That, I mean, that's what Sazerac has right, on their full there's, proof. There's no yeah. definition. That's just what they. I mean, you have Woodford that calls stuff batch proof. You know, you got you can just make whatever you want up. <laughs> that's true, but I do like that we did Green River. You know, we've had it. It's fantastic. Um, I I do wish. I, I don't, I'm not sure what Green River at 119 is. I've had Green River cash drink. That's amazing. Um. I do wish, and I get it, the price point is a fantastic value. The Green River at probably like 100 proof is where it's like perfect. I wish they came out with a bottle and bond like Green River. Um, I think that would done really well. I would say just hang on. <laughs> oh, yeah, it won't be like, long. But, they, have, they have the resources. I'm sure they'll do it. <laughs> I think the weeded and the, the rye bourbon would, is perfectly proofed at 100 proof at for those Green River mash bills, but I'm sure it's coming, so I should just hang yeah. Tight. I'm sure we'll get the news article and we'll be able to talk about it here in a few months. You know, you gotta you gotta spread these out a little bit. You can't make too many splashes in one day. You don't you don't create a tsunami with that. You just gotta do little lots of little ripples. Yeah, but with with Bardstown the Origin series at like forty five bucks, and now Green River at thirty five, it's like Jesus Christ, they're <laughs> offering really good whiskey at really good prices. Yeah. It's hard to compete, isn't it? Yep, it is. Good for them. Go Pritzker. Yep, for sure. But that's going to do it for this week in Bourbon, man. We did it. Another week of the down. But this was uh, one of the longer ones. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to everyone. I'm a little salty tonight about things. So um, I'll I'll do better next week. If you're a teacher in Bardstown, uh, you'd like to have a Rochambeau and kick him in the nuts. We'll (laughs) we'll set it up for you. Well, I'm going on a radio program. I mean, this is being aired on Wednesday, but I'm going on a radio program tomorrow in Bardstown. So... Hopefully the pitchforks and, uh, you know, torches don't come out and they're in town at the jailer's inn or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you need bailed out, just go ahead. You got my, you got my number. I'll be your one phone call. Get a, 
I need GoFundMe. Everyone, our audience will support me, right? <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll finally put all that Patreon money to work. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Bailing Ryan out. Free, free Ryan season. <laughs> all right. Well, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next week. Toodles. <laughs>